Welcome to the review of The Magic Candle, Part 1. The Magic Candle was designed by Ali Adebek and published by Minecraft in 1989. It is a role-playing game, and the purpose is to journey across Deruvia in order to imprison a demon named Dreax into the Magic Candle. The Magic Candle is melting, and you have to figure out a way to stop that. So you begin with one character. His name is Lucas, but you can actually name the character. The name can only be five characters long, however, so you're quite limited. So the game begins by you meeting the king and hearing about the story and getting your quest. This isn't really a classic RPG because you don't make your characters. You have to hire them, and they're always set. You head to the guild, and then you choose which characters you want to recruit. So they're somewhat NPCs, although you can control. So you have the typical fantasy races, such as Halfling, Elf, Dwarf. Here they call Human Man. But you have something interesting. You have a race called Wizard. And the class for the wizard is Mage. So it's kind of like the original dungeon where race and class sometimes merge. So you can view the various attributes and skills before you decide to hire a given party member. It's a little odd, but stamina is your hit points and energy is really your stamina. Some of the controls in the Magic Candle are hard to get used to at first, and they're not very intuitive. So basically you have to call the person, and then once they show up and you make your selection, then you have to invite them to get them to join the party. You can have a maximum of six characters in your party. It is pretty important to have a good diversity in your party because of the various tasks you're going to be trying to accomplish in the game. After you've hired the party members, you exit to get out of the screen. That's one of the quirky things about this game. Any screen you enter, you have to use exit in order to get out of that screen. You can go up and down stairs. When you navigate around, your entire party is represented. You see each character. And it can get quite clunky at times to move around because sometimes they're so blocky that you can't fit through certain spaces. In fact, the travel is quite tedious. I could see some people giving up on the game early because of this. You'll meet all kinds of NPCs in this game. In fact, I can't think of a game that has more NPCs that I've ever played. So you can chat with them, you can greet them, and then ask them specific things or just go with the defaults, like advice and rumors. Sometimes they'll give you useful information, other times it's just nonsense. I would definitely keep a log of what's said because you're going to have to remember it later. Here we're told to eat the master's food, so we follow his advice, and he gives you free food. And yes, you do have to worry about eating, which I'll talk about later. As I mentioned, there's NPCs all over the place, and they each have their own name. It reminds me a lot of Ultima 6, with how there's a community of NPCs that make up the game world. You'll find various doors in which are locked, and you have to know the person's name specifically in order to enter. Without using some kind of hints or cheats, it would take you forever to figure out the names that you need in order to enter these various doors. Here's a funny NPC. He says, come see me tonight in my quarters. The game doesn't have much comedy, but when it does, I think it's coincidental. So here, since we know the guy's name, we finally find the correct door, and he invites us in. This game is full of secrets. You have to discover them in various ways. One is by talking with NPCs. And most of the time they'll give you a clue which leads to another clue which leads to another clue. And they chain together. 
Some games are scavenger hunts for items, and this game has its fair share. But this for sure has a lot more scavenger hunts for information. So eventually you can't figure out what else to do in the castle, so you leave. And you're presented with the main overhead map. And there's many different types of terrains in the game. There's even bridges that you have to cross. There's mountains that are impassable. In fact, here's the map that comes with the game. You can see the world is huge. Remember, this was released in 1989. Eventually, you'll find villages and towns that you can enter. And it remembers which side you actually entered as well. You'll discover quite quickly that the movement sound is very annoying. Just a beep sound, but you can turn it off. You'll run into signs that give you information as you inspect them. Incidentally, you do control V in order to turn off the sound. The world is quite colorful, and all of the buildings that you enter has a lot of charm. Even the NPCs, being as simple as they are, seem to have some character. There's quite a few villages and towns in the game, and they all seem to have their own feel, which is a nice touch. The game does have a concept of night and day, so a lot of buildings will be closed at night time. And you'll have to wait around for the daytime. You can use the pass command to do that, by the way. Time is a factor, because you only have so many days to complete the game. It also affects when certain people will show up at certain locations. So here we pass the time, and then all of a sudden these NPCs on the upper left show up. The upper right of the screen shows the current date and time. It also shows you how many days left you have until the game is over. Sometimes you have to learn from others when to be at a certain place, and other times a sign may tell you. Here, for example, this council hall starts exactly at 1800 hours. The game is filled with many unique events. Here, for example, we offer a drink to a bard, and he sings for us. And, of course, there's no actual music, but we get to read the lyrics. There's a lot of mystery in this game. Sometimes you don't know if you should be writing this down, or if it's just for entertainment. When in doubt, write it down. There's many other types of facilities in the game. For example, here's a library where we can learn special information. A lot of times you learned a certain keyword from another NPC in a totally different area of the world. If you played this game without hints, I could easily see how it would take you over a full year to beat, and even then you may not be able to beat it. Here we purchase a meal, which satisfies our hunger, and we also purchase a drink, which doesn't really seem to have much effect unless you give it to someone else. There's various stores in the game. For example, here's a store where we can buy all kinds of different mushrooms and potions. There's all kinds of other special equipment too, like blankets, boots, medicine. It is a little odd how it works, because when you purchase, it tells you the quantity that you get. And then you put in a lower quantity to get that amount. So when I say purchase one, in this case I actually got 24. So it's a little bit awkward, but you get used to that pretty quickly. It is very tedious how you have to give items to other party members. You have to basically issue this transfer command and you have to be standing right next to the character, say what direction you're going to transfer, and then enter the amount. 
so it takes quite a bit of time. There is a faster command called distribute where you can just evenly distribute it to all party members, so I would frequently use that. You'll stumble across shops that also sell weapons. And you have melee and you have ranged. When you purchase things such as arrows, it allows you to do it in bulk. And you'll actually get a discount based on how many you buy. So a good amount of realism there. You'll eventually find armor shops as well. Here we have one that sells meth real yeah that's right meth real it's supposed to be mithril but well anyway i don't know if meth even existed when this game was made it does take time to make the armor and based on the complexity of the armor you have to wait longer before you can pick it up you also find various places that can increase skills for your characters you pay a certain amount of money and invest the time and then based on your learning skill, it'll determine how rapidly you advance the specific skill. Here, for example, we're training our magic skill. Only certain characters can learn magic, by the way. The game does have some useful user interface warnings at times. For example, here I was going to exit because I thought I had done the training, and it told me, nope. You better keep training or you're going to waste your money. So that's a nice touch. So finally, when training is completed, I get plus five magic skill. Here's another example of training where we could work on our melee ability. There is one really interesting and creative feature in the game, and that's related to splitting up your party. Now other RPGs have had this ability, but the way that Magic Candle does it is a little bit different. You can actually have party members be performing actions simultaneously. Here, for example, we leave a metalsmith behind so that he can work and earn some money. So then we split the party up and we can perform other actions at the same time. Actually, you can split the party up as many times as you want. Here we have our halfling also splitting up as a tailor to earn some money. It asks you if you want to play the other party while this one works and we can switch back to a different party and then have them perform the focused action. In this case we're going to sleep. As you can see on the right side it shows the characters that are in different parties. You can also split the party while you're on an overhead map and leave some of the other party members behind. When you're ready, you can join back up. Now as you leave a town, depending on which side you exit, you'll actually appear on that side on the overhead map. You will find independent inns peppered across the landscape. They're another place where you can rest safely or perform other actions as well. As you sleep, you'll notice that the endurance of each character on the right side increases. Unless, of course, you're hungry. Then in that case, your party member will stay awake and won't be able to sleep. So all we have to do is eat some rations of food and then we can go back to sleep. There's other actions you can perform as well, like fixing a broken weapon or reading to learn some magic spells. You'll notice the graphic actually shows the party member in the appropriate bed, sitting up, fixing their bow, or sitting up reading a book. It's a really charming touch. Spellcasters have a book in which they have various spells, so when they do their reading, they're actually just learning copies of the spell. Kind of how Advanced Dungeons and Dragons works, where you memorize a spell. You'll also run into sanctuaries on the map, and they're a safe place where you can rest for free. And as you leave, the healers typically give you healing potions. 
If you can't find an inn or a sanctuary, you can rest or camp outside. You typically want to have someone on watch though, otherwise you can be ambushed by enemies. As you can see, you get hungry eventually. And it will reach a state of starving. When that happens, your energy drops to zero. And you have to eat some rations of food before you can start to restore it. If this happens in the middle of a town, it can be quite annoying. Especially if you're out of food. Because you basically have to separate the party member from the rest of the party while you hunt for food. So that's a big lesson learned. Now the other thing that's kind of annoying when you start to add the party member back is you have to position the party member in the old spot and then try to join. Otherwise it'll just say can't join here. It took me a while to figure that out. Joining at the overhead map level doesn't have this issue. Speaking of food, one way in order to get food is by doing hunting while you're camping. And the best hunters are rangers typically. So you could have the rest of the party sleep while your best hunter hunts. There's really no notification that you're getting food, but once you finish resting and view the party member, you'll see the food count go up. Only the party member doing the hunting gains food. Sometimes when you're finished hunting, it actually increases. Really, that goes for most skills. As you use them, there's a small chance that you'll get plus one until you reach 99. You can use the transfer and then distribute the additional food. You can actually have multiple people hunt at the same time as well. I mentioned earlier that you can have one of your party members be on watch so that as the rest sleeps, you won't be ambushed. That party member will not gain energy as they watch, but it's well worth it. Here's our first combat introduction, by the way. We'll talk about that later. You're going to run into NPCs that can give random advice and other information. Here they're talking about sermon mushrooms, where they saw them. Sometimes you'll run across merchants that sell goods, selling magical spheres for 22 coins apiece. Or here's a dwarf, and he wants to sell us some gems. There's a lot of bartering and selling in this game in order to make profit. So here we can type in the keyword of gems, see how many we want to purchase, and then go sell them somewhere else for a profit. Sometimes you'll run across NPCs and your charisma is not high enough to speak with them. As I mentioned earlier, the world is huge. So one way to get around is by performing sailing. And you do this by finding a ship captain and asking about the various passages. He'll tell you how much it would cost to sail to a given location, and then you can decide if you want to do that or not. In this case, we're supposed to meet the captain at the docks tomorrow at 7 a.m. So we head to the docks, wait till precisely 7, and then he appears. Now this part of the game has a lot of charm. It reminds me of the Sierra game Gold Rush, where you travel on the ship there. So basically, you can try to sleep or perform other actions. In this case, Dalen's seasick, so all he can do is stay up and 
Get tired. It's a cute little animation of the water moving at the top. And you'll also notice there's clouds and the sun during the daytime. And as it becomes night, it shifts to showing some stars. You can actually let your party members starve and become exhausted. And the ship will still travel, which is nice because if you run out of food, normally you can't move. So eventually you reach your destination and the party's just dropped off on the overhead map. The game does have a save game feature and it allows for multiple slots. Now let's start talking about combat. As you're navigating around, as you get close to an enemy, as long as you're not ambushed, it'll show a skull. And if you touch the skull or it reaches you, then combat begins. There is a flee command, which allows you to move two squares. It's nice to get away from enemies that way. There's also a spell you can cast called Locate. And it'll show the skulls on the various areas of the map so you can avoid them. I really like that feature because sometimes the combat's just tedious and you'd rather avoid it. Another spell is called Assess. And as long as you can see the enemy on the map, it allows you to get a clue as to what's there. In this case, it wasn't very useful. It just says mixed monsters. So as combat begins, it shows a nice little terrain backdrop. And then your party members can either walk and position themselves, or draw a weapon, or even recall a magic spell that they're going to use. This is the strategy portion of the battle. It allows you to prep and get everybody in particular locations. While that does add realism, having to draw the weapon, it also is kind of annoying because there's some times where you forget to draw and then you have to waste a turn during combat. I wish it could just auto draw your weapons. Speaking of equipping, as you do so, the graphic actually updates to show you the weapon that you have equipped. There's also some cool backdrops, like as this bridge. And here's some trees. You'll note that they are impassable, and they can actually change the strategy on how you attack. You can actually have party members go out of order, including even actions within their own turns. When you hit with a melee weapon, it makes a funny noise. And of course, by this time you probably have volume turned off. Some enemies have tons of stamina, like these trolls, and they can even dodge attacks. Now, if a monster is completely surrounded, they don't have the ability to dodge. And that goes for you as well. As I mentioned, you can also use the terrain, such as the bottom of the screen, in order to pin the enemy and only make three required to surround. Now, some enemies have armor, which reduces the amount of damage done. You can tell because in parentheses it says A and then minus the amount that was subtracted. Enemies can dodge range attack just like they can melee. Eventually with your bow and arrow you'll run out of arrows. In that case you have to switch to a melee weapon. This is one of those games where ranged attacks are actually better than melee attacks in general. Not for the damage they do, but the fact that the projectile keeps moving, so if one enemy dodges and there's a bunch in a line, it can hit the enemies behind it. Also, you can't attack on diagonals. You can only attack at right angles. Now, if you're standing behind an enemy and the enemy dodges, it can actually hit one of your characters. If you're standing in front of the enemy, that's not the case. This mechanic results in a lot of strategy being deployed. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some skills will increase as they use them. The bow skill and the sword skill are the equivalent of ranged attacks and melee attacks. When you kill enemies, some of them will not leave a corpse behind them, such as casters. Others will.
Once battle is over, you can search the corpses to find gold. Unfortunately, that's all you will ever find. You can never find items from searching corpses. The AI of the computer is actually pretty decent. Sometimes they'll situate so that the casters are behind the melee. As enemies hit you, you'll see your stamina go down. You do have the ability to dodge, just like monsters can. Most monsters of the same type do about the same amount of damage. And as I mentioned earlier, you can get armor, which is of utmost importance in this game. It tells you how much it absorbs when you get hit. Some of your characters won't start with any armor, and others do. Some enemies are animated when you're just sitting still, which is a nice touch once again. There's all kinds of different monsters in the game, but they all have goofy names. Some have ranged attacks. And some have attacks that always hit. They're basically like spells. The sound effects and animations are kind of cool too. Some of them can do massive amounts of damage as well, such as these Cyclops. Now if the entire party dies, actually technically only if the main character dies, the game's over and you're booted to DOS prompt. There's also enemy casters, whose spells never miss, and they're by far the most dangerous in the game. They can even cast spells that will paralyze you. Here one of the enemy caster moves back to get farther away and then still casts a spell the same round. There's also really powerful enemies like this Dark Knight. There's a very useful spell called Shield which will protect you from magical attacks. To choose your target, you can either press the number representing the party member, or you can use the up and down arrows, and then select. Going into the inventory, you can see the shield level at the bottom of the screen. Now again, it only blocks spells. It does not block physical attacks. That's what armor is for. You can cast shield outside of combat in order to prepare, and the duration is infinite. Sometimes you'll try to cast a spell in combat because you think it would be appropriate, and it tells you not during combat. So then you have to waste a turn trying to recall a different spell. There's an attack spell called Shatter, which does a pretty variable amount of damage but has a pretty high max damage based on your magic ability. There's also another attack spell called Fireball, which is a lot more consistent, but its max damage is lower than Shatter's. Any of the spells that have targets can be blocked based on the terrain. Here are Fireballs being blocked by this wall. There's a fear spell, which causes an enemy to not respond for several rounds during combat. Similarly, there's a freeze spell, paralyzes the enemy. There's also a weakened spell, which reduces the armor and the shield. And you can even cast disappear, which is the equivalent of invisibility. It doesn't last too many turns, but it prevents your party members from being targeted. And you can still move around and it'll show a little box of where your character is. It allows you to sneak up on those casters and attack them before they can get you. 
There's also some spells that hit a mass number of targets. Here we're doing a mass shield. And here this is a mass weakness. And then of course mass attack. They have funny names like Zap All, Zutyan, etc. Now you have to have the special spell book in order to cast those, as I mentioned earlier. There's even a heal all. There's another spell called Vision, which allows you to see what's behind doors and mines and, and dungeons. There's always monsters behind the doors. Now one of the most useful spells is Teleport. You can actually use it to teleport across water areas. It uses up a lot of energy though. In fact, that's something I haven't mentioned yet. All spells use energy. There really are no magic points. There's also something called a teleportal house that you'll eventually run across. You have to use special items in order to make it work. There's many consumables in the game, a lot of them being potions and mushrooms. There's a type called Ganshi, which gives the character that eats it three actions in the first turn in combat. They can be combined with other types of drinks and mushrooms, such as Lufins, whereas a Lufin guarantees the hit is 100% chance. So use that in combination with three actions, and that first round you do some massive damage. There's also something called a Nift, which blocks physical attacks. One Nift can block three physical attacks. Nifts do not protect you from spells, however. You can look at your inventory to see what spells are in use, as you can see in the in use box. Eventually, when your energy runs low, you'll become tired status, which can be fixed by what's called a sermon. Yeah, there's some weird terminology in this game. It takes a while getting used to. Some enemies do special attacks, like this one can make you ill. And when you are ill, you can only restore your energy up to 49 maximum, including using a sermon potion, which would usually give you 99. You can use potions to heal, which restores your stamina all the way back to 99. So the more hit points you have, the more use you get out of your potions. Now if you're poisoned, your stamina still only goes up to 49, even when you use a healing potion. There's also a heal spell, which has the same effect. Until you figure out how to use these mushrooms and potions to your advantage, you'll be dying all the time. And if you do die and you leave combat, the party member disappears from your party. However, there is one spell book that has a resurrect spell. Once combat's over, you can cast it and target the dead person and they'll appear back in your party. There are many spells you can get in this game. Naturally, certain spells require more energy use than others, and the time to learn them during camping or sleeping is variable. As you wander around the world, you'll eventually come across mines. These mines are infested with demon kin. The mines are similar to dungeons in that they're very dangerous. You can go up and down stairs. And it's good to have a nice hunting skill, because otherwise you'll get ambushed. Now the way combat works, which I didn't mention earlier, there is no real initiative. If you are not ambushed, your whole party goes first. Then the monsters go. If it's an ambush, it's the opposite. All the monsters go and then you go.
Here our hunting skill prevents an ambush. That means that we go first in combat. I find it funny how monsters appearing have a different tone each time. Helps to break up the monotony a little bit. It's a wide variety of tough monsters down here. There's also traps in mines. Here we just hit a time trap, which essentially just accelerates time. You also find locked treasure chests. The only way to open them is to use a pick. There is no spell to open treasure chests, at least not that I could find. Here we triggered a poison trap. There's also traps that can make you ill and other various effects. Inside the treasure chest there's always some kind of treasure. Here we find 10 pearls, which we'll use later. Sometimes the treasure chest won't have any trap on it. In this case we found 48 nifts. and six locas. So there's also dungeons, which I mentioned are similar to mines, but in order to get into most of these dungeons you have to chant a special password. Remember earlier when I told you to write everything down? There's a lot of words. Once you're in the dungeon you explore just like you do in the mines. Here we run across a bowl and we drop one of those pearls in that we found. And lo and behold, it presents a map showing where we're at and the layout of the dungeon. Pretty cool. There's so many different things you can do in this game. For example, here a queen will tell us about how many enemies are at certain levels in certain areas. I've tried to incorporate a lot of features in this game but believe me, there's many, many more types of events and things that can happen that I haven't even mentioned. Just as an example, you can stumble across special locations. Like here we found a bunch of magic plants. And we can pick these lufins and collect them for the party. There's all kinds of hidden treasures like this. Here we stumble across an elf maiden. We can get some information from her. Boy, is she innocent. She doesn't know what a rumor is. Eventually, you can find a different guild that has different NPCs or characters for you to invite. It's pretty far away from where the original guild is though, so by the time you reach it, you probably have already progressed some of your other characters. You'll stumble across some mysterious buildings that do have purposes. Most things in this game have a purpose. But I'm trying to avoid as many spoilers as possible in case some of you want to play. But as I said earlier, the name of this game is Information. Sometimes the information is more obvious and you're told exactly who to look for or what to do. And other times it'll be very cryptic. Here we're in a temple, and we have to use a lens in order to read this. And what does it tell us? 
Tuum, abatum, uh, okay, yeah, whatever. Just write it down. So in closing, what did I think about the magic candle? Well, it was actually quite refreshing. It was a lot more complicated than I expected, especially from a 1989 game. I feel like the storyline was fantastic, and the number of NPCs and the diversity there was fantastic as well. There was quite a bit of tediousness, like combat became kind of frustrating because you do not earn experience points, you do not level up, you basically just improve some simple skills. So it was hard to make it feel like an RPG from that aspect. So overall, I think the game was a lot of fun with some frustrations mixed in. It was very time consuming, just a warning for anyone that wants to play the game and play it legitimately. The sound on the game was very lacking. For 1989, there were quite a few games that had much better usage of the PC speaker. But the graphics actually were very pleasing. I liked the color schemes and the representation of all the different characters and there's a lot of nice finishing touches in this game. Had I known about it in 1989 and been able to play it, I would have thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm about ready to show you the end of the game when you beat it. So if you don't like spoilers, I recommend stop watching now. So I hope you enjoyed this review of the Magic Candle Part 1, and I'll see you next time.